If you're thankful for Jesus tonight, say amen. 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 Now I'm going to go ahead and warn you ahead of time. If you decide to be quiet, this is going to make it awful difficult on a man. So you're going to have to be ready to respond to some stuff here in a little bit. So, very fortunate that I get to be with you guys tonight. I feel very privileged to get to come and speak. Um, you go ahead and grab a Bible. You will need one of those. Go ahead and grab a Bible. Go to Acts chapter 4. And uh, we'll be in Acts chapter 4, well, whenever we get there. That might be a few minutes from now. You know, it's really cool when you look at kind of the blueprint of what the church is. And as you go back specifically in the book of Acts, and uh, as you look at the church and its establishment, and you look at how they felt and what they did and the way they went about things, um, it really gives us a better picture of who God wants us to be. And so uh, I appreciate the topic tonight very much. Attitude of the believers. I tell our kids all the time, by our kids, I'm not a parent yet, but I feel like I am. Uh, with the youth group there in Shakota, a bunch of those kids, they keep me pretty busy. Um, between that and the, and the pulpit, we stay pretty hooked up. But uh, I tell them all the time, I say, hey, you need to have an attitude of gratitude today. Have an attitude of gratitude. And so hopefully you're happy to be here. If not, that's going to make this tough. But uh, hopefully you're excited. Um, hopefully you're about ready to get fired up here. In Acts chapter 4, we're talking about the attitude of the believers. Uh, let's go ahead and read through this together. And then we're going to go back and we'll make some applications uh, here in a little bit. Acts chapter 4, let's start reading together in verse 32. It says, In the congregation of those who believed, were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each, each to the extent that they had any need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, owned a tract of land. So he sold it and brought the money at the apostles' feet. That's some pretty powerful stuff right there. And I think if we look at Acts chapter 4, specifically verses 32 through 37, there are some conclusions for you and I. And I want to challenge you, by the way. As we look at these passages, uh, I want to challenge you to go beyond your typical way of thinking. Don't read this as something you've read a thousand times. Read this as something you're reading for the very first time. And what I always find so cool about the Bible is every single time I study it, something else is exposed in the text. And I think that's amazing. So I challenge you to look at the text that way. There's a several applications. Really, there's four applications we're going to make tonight. Four things that I think we get from this text. Four ideas uh, that come from this as we look at what they were doing. The first one being this. And if you're taking notes, we'll be all up here to make it really easy for you. The first one being that a giving church is a growing church. Now, I'm going to go ahead and stop. When I say a giving church is a growing church, I'm not necessarily talking about when we pass the plate around and you put money in it. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about when I say giving. But a giving church is a growing church. I want you to notice a couple of really key phrases in verses 34 and 35 of Acts chapter 4. It says, for there was not a needy person among them. Man, church, wouldn't that be awesome if there were not a needy person among us? And then verse 35, it said, and they would be distributed. That is the, the proceeds of the sales. It says that they would be distributed to each to the extent that any had need. I don't find it ironic. I don't find it coincidence that a giving church and a growing church are the same thing. And when I look at these two verses in particular, there was not a needy person among the church. Can you imagine if we got to the point where we're looking out at our congregations and there is no poverty and there, there was no need because we were giving them all that they needed. And if you're still not sure about this, a giving church is a growing church. There are several phrases throughout the book of Acts and the Lord was adding to their number day by day. Those who were being saved. You see that in chapter two. Large numbers of men and women were being added to their number in chapter 5. 
As the disciples were increasing in number in chapter 6, the number of men came to be about 5,000. That's right here in chapter 4. I want to talk to you for a second about something that I think is so important, and that is vision. I want to ask you tonight a really, really important question, and the question is this. Where do you see your congregation three, four, five years from now? Like, what, what, what direction do you see yourself going? When you look at your leadership, do you see there being positive steps forward in your leadership? I mean, I have to start there. Do you have a vision for what God is going to do with your churches? Be assured, to be honest, if we ever get to the point where we don't have a vision and we don't expect things from God, nothing's going to happen. If we don't have a vision and we don't have an understanding, if we don't have confidence that God's going to bless our churches, he's not going to. I hope that you have a vision tonight. For there was not a needy person among them. A giving church is a growing church. Think about this. In Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now pay really close attention to this. It says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Now, I don't know about you. But that really touches me every time I read it. Every single time. A giving church is a growing church. And why is a giving church a growing church? Jesus said, I'll tell you what, you want to serve me? You know the best way to serve Jesus right here, right now? Serve each other. Serve each other. That's how we serve Jesus. You don't believe that. Think about this. From Genesis to Revelation, and Jesus sums up the entire Bible in two sentences. You know the two sentences, don't you? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Upon thee hang the law and the prophets. I mean, this is a question I ask myself all the time. You want to see your congregations grow? And some have said, well, Chase, it's not about numbers. I understand. They say it's always about spiritual growth. You're not always looking at numbers. And I get that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But think about this. I'm a believer that if we grow spiritually, we will get to a point where there is no helping it. We're going to go out there, and we're going to tell people about Jesus. I'm a firm believer in that. I've always been a believer. That if you have that kind of growth taking place in your life, you can't help it. In fact, you go to Acts chapter 4, right before we get to our text here tonight, what happens? As Peter and John are arrested, and they say, don't do that again, and what do they say? Whether it is right the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. But as for us, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. You want your churches to grow? I mean, I have this vision for Shakota, and my leadership, my eldership, they feel the same way. We have this vision for where we're going, and the vision of this. The vision is one day a new church building because we can't sit everybody in the pews anymore. Because we just don't have room, because we outgrow it. Our vision is a, is a parking lot that can't fit all the cars from all the people, members, and visitors alike every single week. We can't fit them, so we're having to go and get a new parking lot. Our vision is a youth group that is so large that the church is seeing that ministry, and they are encouraged by it. There's a vision. You have a vision for where you're going. What do you see yourself? Three years, four years, five years. Maybe you don't look that far. Maybe it's six months. Maybe it's a year. Where do you see your churches? And if the answer is exactly what you are right now, <laughs> brothers and sisters, something is wrong. Okay, think about this vision. And if you want to achieve that, we have to understand that a church that grows is a church that gives, a church that serves each other. Everything that you and I are at our core is serving each other. 
It's always been about each other. It always has. You look at the Ten Commandments even. How many of those commandments were pertaining to relationship with each other? I find it interesting that relationship with God and is totally dependent upon relationship with each other. And when you put the two together, you can't help but get the cross. Because in the cross, you see the idea of serving each other. So is this the attitude of Jesus? If you, as you look at Matthew 25, you see that everything about Jesus and who he was, he spent all of his time helping people, serving people, healing people. That's who Jesus was. And that's who he wants us to be too. So what do you think Jesus is going to do with a church who is trying to act just like him? Church, I can answer that. He's going to bless it. He's going to bless it. A leadership that tries to act just like him, what's God going to do with that leadership? He's going to bless them. Now, am I telling you that the moment you start giving, you're going to explode? That's not what I'm telling you. But I'm saying have a vision for where you're going and don't stop till you get there. I think Bo Jackson said something like that one time. Do you believe that God is a promise keeper tonight? Do you believe that God is a promise keeper? I'm going to say this, and I want you to fill in the blank. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be open. Is God a promise keeper? He is, right? So when God tells me if I seek him, then I will find him. What do I believe? I believe that if I seek him, I believe if I seek the lost, that God is going to help me be fruitful in that labor. And I think this is really important too. I think this is really important. Who is it that was adding to their number? Was it Paul? Was it the apostles that were adding to the number? No, 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 no. It's important that us preachers sometimes kick ourselves out of the way. You know what I'm saying? Kick ourselves out of the way and say, no, 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 no. Get your eyes off me and get your eyes on Jesus. Who was adding to their number? The Lord was adding to their number. Not Chase, not Curtis, not Tracy, not anyone else, not J.D., no one, right? It's not about us. We don't add to the number. We are but a vessel for God. It is the Lord who adds to their number. It's something else I find really interesting. If you look in these same couple of verses, whose money and possessions in these people's minds that they're giving and serving, whose possessions were those? They were God's, weren't they? It changes everything about your mentality when you begin to understand that everything you have, you have because God gave it to you. My family, my beautiful wife that blesses my life every single day, when I recognize that that is a gift that God has given me, it changes the way I see and treat her. When I treat my home and my vehicles, my income, whatever it is, you fill in the blank in your own life. When you begin to view every possession that you have as not belonging to you, it changes everything. How do we bless people? By using what God has given us. By using what rightfully belongs to God in the first place. The Lord was adding. A giving church is a growing church. Another application I find really cool is this. And is that a church united is a church ignited. You look in verse 32 and verse 33. And again, I've highlighted a couple of things just to kind of get your mind understanding. And the congregation of those who believe were of one heart and soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was on them all. Do you find it a coincidence that, being, that the church that is of one heart and one soul is also the church that is igniting? That is, that is fired up about their faith. I mean, can we be real tonight? I like being real. I like being honest, okay? Chances are there's some hard feelings right here in this room. Honestly, that's probably a, a pretty strong possibility. Chances are when you go back, for some of you that are visiting tonight, in your home congregations, chances are there's tension there somewhere with someone. Maybe not. Maybe you have a perfect church, and, and I'm, I hope that you do. I, I, I'm excited for you. But chances are... There's tension somewhere, and there's damaged relationships somewhere. There, there is an impasse that has been reached among believers. I'm a young guy, okay, and I know that I don't know anything, but I'll tell you something that I've seen with my own two eyes, and maybe this hits home with you too. I have seen ministries destroyed because people could not get along. 
I've seen churches go into shambles because you had an elder and preacher relationship problem. I've seen churches where the leadership themselves, elder, 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 deacon, 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 whatever, or just member, member. So where there was damaged relationship to the point where ministries were absolutely ruined. Where evangelism, think about this. Is it worth hindering the progression of the gospel? I mean, think about it. Every single one of us know what hurt feels like, right? Every single one of us know what that feels like. We know what it feels like when someone is disloyal to you, when someone does something to you, and it frustrates you, and it stinks because you've done nothing but love them. We all know that feeling. But are those hard feelings worth hindering the progression of the gospel? Because church, let me ask you this. If you're going out there, and I hope that you are, because that is everything that we are. When you go out there and you say, you got to come be a part of this, why would they want to come be a part of a church that can't get along? They want nothing to do with that. I know from my perspective, if I'm out there and I see someone coming to me and sharing Jesus with me, and they say, you got to come be a part of this congregation, and I see tension, why in the world would that be appealing to me in the slightest? It happens. Bad relationships within the church, sometimes they kill ministries. In verse 32, those who believe were of one heart and one soul. That is much uh, is as much a reason for the progression of the church as anything else that you find in the Bible because they were united. Church, can you imagine, can you picture a situation where we're on the same page and where we're getting along and there's no hard feelings, there's no tension? A church united is a church ignited. Sometimes bad relationships within the church kill ministries. Hey, let me tell you what happens. I'm really, really mad. Say I'm really, really mad at Brother Bob, and everybody knows it. At first, maybe he's the only one that knows it. And I mean, I'm like super mad at him, and eventually Brother Bob figures out I'm super mad at him, and guess what? Now he's super mad at me. And before long, Sister Pat knows that Brother Bob and I are having problems. And before long, someone else recognizes she's not real happy with me because I'm how I'm handling Brother Bob. And then it goes from there, and it's like this big progression, and things go south really quickly. And then before long, you have bad relationship everywhere, and guess what happens? Nothing can get done. Nothing can get done. We can't be growing. We can't be striving for new levels in our faith, new levels in our churches, because bad relationships won't let that happen. They kill our ability. Our inability to be on the same page will kill our ability to reach out and share Jesus with people because people want no part of a church that's already divided before they walk in a door. Which leads me to another really interesting conclusion that I found in this text. Okay, These are just things that I've kind of picked up on. And that is that a church divided is a church defeated. A church divided is a church defeated. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you are made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. And if you read later on in chapter 1, you, you find exactly what they're talking about. Some were saying, I am of Paul, some I am of Apollos. It's kind of that, that preacher problem we're talking about, that, that this preacher, this apostle, this person kind of became their God in a sense. That's who they worship even more than God. That's, I'm of this person. And Paul says, I urge you. Is that not pretty strong language? It is, right? Because I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. Now, this is where I know we don't, we don't like this, but the word translated division in verse 10, you know what else that word could say? Denomination. That there be no denominations among you. We don't think about it that way. But when you and I can't get along, what we've just done is create a denomination. We've created a division, something that has split away from the will of God, from the will of Jesus that you all agree that there be no divisions among you and that you be made complete. You know, I'm not so foolish to think that there won't be problems because, you know, I don't know if you've ever come to this conclusion or not. The church would be a pretty cool place if we just kicked all the people out. I don't know if you ever thought about that or not. The 
church would be pretty cool if we would just God would just kick all of us out of it. It'd be like the world, you know, the world would be a pretty awesome place if God would just wipe us out. I'm not so naive to think that there won't be bad relationships. I'm not so naive to think that there won't be hard feelings. I know that that's how it happened from the very beginning of time. When you have people, you have problems. You have differences of opinion. You have differences of thinking. All of those things are going to happen. But here's just a thought. What if, and I say what if, what if you and I decided, you know what? It doesn't matter what they've done. It doesn't matter if I feel the same way. It doesn't matter if we're on the same page. It doesn't matter how upset I am. What if we decided it's not worth it? And what if we decided to put our differences aside and decide to do the very thing that's more important than anything else, and that's getting busy winning souls for Jesus? Amen, church? What if we got to that point where we kicked ourselves out? I like to think about this. Sometimes when you're driving down the road of life, sometimes you're in the driver's seat, right? Like sometimes we're in the driver's seat. We don't like giving up control. And sometimes we're driving down the, the highway of life, and what we need to do is pull over kick ourselves out of the driver's seat and just let Jesus take the wheel. Oh, yeah, that's a Carrie Underwood reference right there from Dakota, my girl. Can't help us, my hometown girl right there. But it's really cool, this idea of letting Jesus take over and letting him go on the road that is life and letting him be in the driver's seat. A church united is a church ignited. It's no, it's no question in my mind that when you're united and when you're on the same page, it ignites in you a fire to get things going. But a church divided is a church defeated. No one is going to want to have anything to do with a church that's divided. We have to be all on the same page. There's a fourth application, and, and I want you to really dig when you think about this one. Because as you look at what they were doing, and the way they were serving each other, and the way they went about relationships, there's another really important conclusion that we want to come to. And that is that a prosperous church doesn't equal a purposeful church. A prosperous church doesn't necessarily equal a purposeful church. And here's what I mean by that. Having money, okay, there's this, this idea floating around in culture and society that says the more money you have, the more meaningful your life becomes. The more possessions, the nicer the house, the nicer the cars, the nicer things you have, the more purpose your life will have. Church, you know better than that, though, don't you? Prosperity doesn't necessarily equal purpose. It's a false idea. It, it doesn't necessarily equal your life having purpose. And as you go back and you read this again, I want to read those same two verses in 34 and 35, but I want to highlight a, a different section. It says, For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each to the extent that any had need. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be honest for a second. When I read passages like this, I kind of have guilt that builds up in my mind and in my heart, to be honest. I think about my home, and I think about my vehicles, I think about my income, I think about my possessions, and when I read this, I can't help but think, am I really doing right by God and by people by having all that I am and not giving more? Jesus was really clear about something. He says, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, and I would hear a preacher stand before me, and he would say something like this. Now, I want you to know, okay, I, I want you to know, God's not actually saying that you need to give up something. Like, he's not actually saying that you should give up a possession. He's not saying you should give more money. He's just saying. And I'm like, okay, what is he just saying if that's not what he's saying? Someone says, Lord, I want to follow you, but first let me go and say goodbye to those at home. Jesus says, no man having put his hand in the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Someone says, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now, when you read that passage, by the way, understand that his father probably wasn't dead yet. It was probably more about, let me wait this out so that I could receive my inheritance money. He says, let me first go and bury my father. And what does Jesus say? He says, no, 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 no. Let the dead bury their own dead. Take up your cross. Come follow me. What is he saying? He's saying, kick self out of the way. 
He's saying, give it up. He's saying, give up your inheritance. Give up your family. Jesus, that sounds harsh. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel at its core is take what God has given you and bless someone else with it. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about how many things I can have and how nice of things I can have. It's how much I can bless someone else. You know, there's been a conversation recently. Someone said, can we really bless each other or isn't that just God blessing? Like, people can't bless. Only God can bless. God blesses through us sometimes because we are vessels. Sometimes the greatest thing God could ever do for a person is send another person into their life. Sometimes the greatest blessing that God can be to that person who doesn't know Jesus is send someone into their life that's ready to tell them about him. God uses us as a vessel if we will let him. A prosperous church doesn't necessarily equal a purposeful church. It doesn't matter how much money you have. I've seen churches barely making it that were reaching people far more than those who have an abundance of money. It's just how it is. It's not about how much money you have. It's about where your heart is, and it's about wanting to live a life of purpose. A prosperous church doesn't necessarily equal a purposeful church. Doesn't this chapter really completely dismantle society's idea of prosperity? And in case you're not familiar with the prosperity gospel movie, you ever heard about the prosperity gospel before? There are people making, I mean like, mega buttloads of money by feeding off of those that are impoverished. I mean, they're going around and they're preaching, man. I'll tell you what, I know that you're you're not really making it, and I know that you're probably not going to be able to pay your bills at the end of the month, but if you'll just give this ministry a thousand dollars, or even if that's on TV, maybe it's not a thousand, for one low price of nineteen ninety nine a month, God is going to bless you six months from now. Oh, you wait to see what God's going to do with you. People are getting absolutely filthy rich by telling people that if they give, God is going to bless them with money. And it's absolutely embarrassing that anyone would ever come to that conclusion. I don't believe in that idea. But church, I do believe that we will be blessed if we bless. As a matter of fact, I believe that very strongly because the Bible is very strong about that idea. A prosperous church doesn't equal a purposeful church. Prosperity doesn't equal purpose. And I'm going to say this, and I want you to hear this. If you've heard nothing else I say so far, I want you to hear what I'm about to say next. Okay, you got that? If you haven't heard anything else, I want you to hear what I'm about to say for the next five minutes. This is a struggle with nearly every single person that has ever walked the planet. What am I doing here? Like, what is my life? What is my purpose? Is it my job? Is it my family? Like, what is it in life that gives you purpose? And I want to ask you that right now. I mean, I, I really want you to take a second and evaluate. What is it that makes you who you are? What is it that gets you excited for those of us who grew up in this area? What is it that cranks your tractor? All right. What gets you going? What gets you excited when you wake up in the morning and you start your day? Where's your mind? What are you thinking about when you lay your head down on the pillow at night? When you are so excited about where you're going in life, what is it that gets you there? Every single person has this inward struggle at one point or another in their life. And it sounds something like this. I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. I don't really know who I'm supposed to be. I don't really know God's will for my life. I don't really know why I'm here. Like, am I just here? It, 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 am I trying to go there? Does, does that, does all that stuff, does that even exist? Like, because that's what we do, right? We're like, well, God's up there. Let me tell you, if you're content with a God that's up there and not right here, then you and I need to have conversation. Because I don't want some God who is, who is, who is, uh, only there for me on Sundays and Wednesdays. I want a God who is there with me when I wake up in the morning. I want a God who walks beside me in my day and carries me through my prayers and a God who, who, who helps me get through difficult times. I'm not content with a God who's up there. But every single person at one point or another in their life will wrestle with what the purpose of their life really is, and they don't really understand it. The only thing in existence, and I want to make this very clear, the only thing in existence that gives life purpose is a relationship with a man named Jesus. It's always been Jesus, 
It's still Jesus, and it always will be Jesus. It's the only thing in your life that gives you purpose. You can try. I've noticed this about people. There's this hole inside that every person is born with. Every person has this hole inside, and what they try to do is fill it with something. And you've seen this in your life or in the life of someone that you're really close to. They try to fill it with something. Sometimes they try to fill it with work. Like, I'm just going to work really hard 24-7 all the time, and they try to fill it with work. For other people, it's relationships. The, that hole that they have, they try to fill it with some relationship, some friendship. That's how they try to cope with the hole that they have inside them. They try to fill it with something. But the only thing in existence that gives life purpose, far more than something as silly as money, far more than some jobs, far more even than our marriages, or our relationships, the only thing that gives your life purpose is having a relationship with Jesus. Now I want to make a really interesting point here. And I know this is going to it's going to be interesting. There was a study that was done by 21st century Christian. And it said that the average person claiming to be a Christian in the United States gives God on average about 90 minutes a week. 90 minutes a week. Now, though, this is obviously very loose, but those who claim to be Christians, on average, give God 90 minutes a week. Now, there are 60 minutes in an hour. Okay? There are 24 hours in a day. There are seven days in a week. You see where I'm going with this? You see how quickly those minutes stack up in your head? Now, here becomes a really important question, okay? This is really what I want to get into. I want you to picture that 90-minute-a-week concept. Does my life really have purpose? This is a really good way to figure that out. 90 minutes a week is all we give God. And sometimes we have a hard time doing that, can we be honest? I mean, can we be honest? Sometimes we have a hard time doing that. We have a hard time getting there Sunday morning, Sunday night, for those that have it, Wednesday night. We have a hard time because we have things going on. I want you to think about this. What would happen if we gave our marriage 90 minutes a week? I'll tell you what you can do. You can throw that out. That's not going to work, right? What about our business? Those of us who own businesses, what if you gave your business 90 minutes a week? It'll crumble. It's not going to work. Our job, oh, you're going to like this one. Boss, I'm sorry. I've come to a conclusion. 90 minutes a week is all I can give you. Like, that's it. Can I still be like on a full time payroll? That's not going to work, right? 90 minutes a week. You can go there and do this with all of those. What would happen if you gave your family, those beautiful kids, that spouse, what if you gave your family 90 minutes a week? Or how about this one? How about rest? What if you only took 90 minutes a week to sleep and to rest? That wouldn't work. What about our hobbies? Those, we have things that we like to do, and what I've noticed is that when we have things we like to do, we make time for them. What if we gave our hobbies 90 minutes a week? Most of us probably give it far more than that. I spend a lot of time on lakes chasing large mouth and small mouth bass, I'll be honest with you. 90 minutes a week. What about our relationships? Any friendship? I can bet that any of you who say, I have a bestie for the rescue guy, like I got a BFF, you give them a lot more than 90 minutes a week. You're on the phone every day. You're texting. You're Snapchatting. You give them a lot more than 90 minutes a week. For the student in school, okay, what if you gave education 90 minutes a week? Sorry, principal. My kids come to a conclusion. 90 minutes a week, that's the only thing they, can, they cannot go beyond that. Oh, here's a really good one. Sustenance. What if you gave your sustenance, in other words, what you eat, how you sustain yourself, 90 minutes a week? I could have done what we did right in there for like six hours, to be honest. I really, I like the whole eating and fellowshipping thing. Church, you see my point? But I think there's something equally as powerful in this slide. As you look at all of these things, as you look at your marriage, and as you look at your job, as you look at all of these things, it doesn't take a very smart person to understand that if you gave them 90 minutes a week, they're not going to work. But there's another point here, and I don't want you to miss it. And it's this. If you take God and you place him here, that equals a life of purpose right there. And let me give you another thing. If you put God here, you will be better at your job. It's 
I guarantee you'll be a better worker. You'll work harder. You won't complain as much. If you put God here, you'll be a better employee. I can tell you this one, and this makes me so emotional every single time. If you put God here, you will be a better spouse. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. If you put God here, you will be a better husband. You will be a better wife. If you put God here, you will be a better family man. Now, this is where we're going to be careful. I'm not saying if you put God here in your business, you're going to become a millionaire. But if you put God on first, I believe God's going to bless you in some way. He will make sure you have what you need. There's something about going to bed at night when you're resting and knowing that you have a relationship with Jesus. It's just very peaceful for me. It's very calming. In the calamity of life, laying my head down knowing that I have that relationship and I have that hope of eternal life, it's what gets me through. You will enjoy your hobbies more. You will have more meaningful relationships. You will be a better student in school. Now, this we're, the sustenance one, the whole food thing, we may not go there. I think it's funny that we pray, Lord, I pray that you bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies, and then we continue, uh, we proceed to eat 4,600 calories that's going to clog our arteries. God bless it that it nourished my body as I'm about to just absolutely founder myself. But you see my point. All of those things, if you give it 90 minutes a week, it's not going to work. What makes you think that a relationship with God that only gets 90 minutes a week is going to last? Because church, it won't. I've seen it happen. And what makes the difference? How do I know if I'm living a life of purpose? How do I know that prosperity is not what I think gives my life purpose? If God is up here, then life has purpose. If God is number one, now this is a really crazy concept. You ever heard somebody say, make God your number one priority? I don't believe in that, and I'll tell you why. Because if you're like me, you have to write down everything you do, and you have lists. Right? We have lists. I need to get this done, this done, this done. If God is your number one priority, then what you will find yourself doing is, is he's number one. That's the first thing you do to start your day, and then you move on to the next thing. Rather than making God your number one priority, make him the center of all of your priorities. And it changes perspective. A relationship with God that only gets 90 minutes a week is not going to last. As would it, I mean, no relationship would last. Make God the center of your life. And not only make God the center of your life, but I want you to think really seriously. I've alluded to this like 10 times already, and there's a reason for it. The best way I can think of to make sure that God is number one in your life if you're sharing your faith, if you're reaching out to people and you're trying to reciprocate that feeling you have, if you go and share your faith with people and you say, hey, I've got some good news. If you, we call it the good news. You ever notice that the gospel, we call it the good news. I don't. Good news is Chick-fil-A is opening a new location in Shakota. That's good news. This is great news, right? This goes beyond good news. This is the greatest news that anyone has ever heard at any time in history. Make God the number one in your life and watch and see what he does with you. Church, I hope that as you look at Acts chapter 4 and I hope that as you look at the way they were devoted to each other, I hope that you understand these four things, that a giving church is a growing church. You want your churches to grow, you want them to explode, be a church that gives and gives and serves and serves. A church united is a church ignited. A church divided is a church defeated. And a prosperous church doesn't equal a purposeful church. I really hope you think about all of this. I really hope that you're taking this in. My life, I am happier than probably any person. I'm not going to say happy. I am as happy as any person that's ever walked the planet, if you can't tell. There's just an excitement that I have about life. And the only reason that that is there is because of what God has done in my life. Let me tell you something. I was a 17-year-old kid the first time anybody really ever got a hold of me. And they took me under their wing, and they created something in me that I want to go and help create in someone else. There are people in my life, a few of them sitting in this room, that have had a bigger impact on me than words could ever, ever say. Church, go and be that for someone else. Go and be that. Go and be that influence. Go and show other people how happy God makes you. Let's pray together. Father.
Father, I thank you so much for your word and the blessings that we have in you. Father, I thank you so much for the church, and I pray that we will be more like the church that you would have us to be. God, help us to kick ourselves out of the driver's seat. Help us to put you first. Help us to put you in the center. Father, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters that are here tonight, and I pray that you will bless them. God, help us to be more like your son Jesus every single day, and it's in his name. Church, we're going to offer up a song of invitation, and uh, I know this is something we do week after week, and it gets to the point where it becomes like everything else. I really want you to think about where you're at in your relationship with Jesus. Even for those of us who have obeyed the gospel, we've been baptized into Christ, maybe we've had and we've come to the conclusion that church has become something that we do rather than who we are, and that's the difference. Maybe church has become something that you do rather than who you are. Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. I promise you we will pray about it. We can have everybody here praying about it. Maybe you want to know what it is to become a Christian. Maybe you're thinking about that. Whatever your need, we want to make sure that every single person here has an opportunity to respond in whatever way you feel the need to respond. If you want to do that, please.